Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of Peter Bryan. Absolutely, whoa, hold on to your hats. This one had the vein a pulsing. Mm -mm. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! We are going to London, baby. London. London town. I have been umming and ahhing about where to start with this story. Yeah, which has been confusion. So I think I'm going to start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Let's start at the beginning of the notable incidents. Let's do that. Okay, mm -hmm. let's do it. That takes us to 1987. The police were called to a block of flats in East London. The victim had called the police to say that a man named Peter Bryan had tried to throw him from the sixth floor of that building. Unsuccessfully, thankfully, but that the attack had been completely unprovoked. So quite worrying, very scary. Someone's just tried to throw you off of a building to your death. Here is the first of many moments of really. The police chose to take absolutely no action, at, like none at all, towards Peter Bryan. So he, he, they knew they knew who he was, but no, nothing. Bryan was an adult. He was eighteen at the time, and he was known to the police. So it, the mind boggles, doesn't it? Peter Bryan was born in October of 1969 in London. Both of his parents, however, were from Barbados and they moved to the UK in the 1950s. Obviously fancied some rain. Both of Bryan's parents worked full time. So he spent a lot of time with babysitters and childminders and things like that. And his mother, from what I read, was quite absent, really, because when they had moved to the UK, they had actually left some older children back in Barbados. So she was working, but then also she would travel quite frequently back to Barbados, get the sunshine, oh, hello Specs, and see her older children. So she wasn't around an awful lot. It sounds like there was a bit of, I'm going to use the word abandonment, because I guess to a child it would have felt like that. But yeah, so I, I think that that was something to note in his childhood anyway. He also really didn't have an easy time of it at school because he struggled academically. He had dyslexia. He went on to be diagnosed with that after they realised that he just was really struggling. And he needed to have extra help and things like that, which he found shameful. He was really ashamed of that. I, th I think most kids like don't you don't want to feel different or less than, do you? And he also struggled to make friends, and he was a loner at school. And he became a bully. He was very unkind to other children, especially those that he perceived to be a lot weaker than him. And he really wanted power and control. That was quite important to him, which to me screams a huge lack of self esteem. And then in secondary school, it just mm. So he becomes a more violent bully and towards male pupils and then towards female pupils. He is just, well, what would you call it? Harassment, like sexual harassment, but like fondling girls in school, really inappropriate, like touching and oh, yeah, awful. He ended up being suspended from school because he slapped a teacher, a female teacher. He joined a gang. He started smoking weed when he was 12 years old. Again, joining a gang gives you power, control, people fear you, you get respect. And at quite a young age, he was then involved in robbery, carrying weapons, dealing drugs, taking drugs, leaving school early, just lots of antisocial behaviour and criminal activity going on. And then there's this almost like complete I think this comes up quite a lot in this story, actually, in this case. There's another side of Brian, and perhaps, I don't know, maybe, I mean, his parents were really hardworking, so, like, he obviously had a high work ethic, 
But then also because of joining the gang, the other side of him was into criminal behaviour and, and stuff. But there's a real like two sided coin going on. So while he is still being a criminal, he gets a job on a clothing stall on Petticoat Lane Market in London. So he gets himself a job as well, alongside the criminal activity. He also goes and works at the local soup kitchen. I mean, these things don't match, do they? Like robbing people, mugging people, stealing from shops, carrying weapons, dealing drugs, and then, oh, work at the soup kitchen. Like, I've never really heard of that before, like a case like that where... Yeah, they're two very different things. Like that is that is not that doesn't feel like the same person, does it? And also having an actual job as well. So two jobs, but in your spare time, robbing people. I just find it a bit mm -hmm, contradictory. I believe he leaves the job on the stool, but but he gets another job. So he then gets a job in an actual clothing shop. This is as a like you know sales assistant. And now we really get to see, like, you know, some of his behaviour. And he was far from the model employee. So while he did go out and get himself a job, a couple of jobs, he wasn't he wasn't actually like he didn't commit properly. He was often he would just not turn up for weeks on end. I'm surprised he managed to keep this job, to be fair. They were very, very, very patient with Brian. And I really think that they probably wish they hadn't been. Anyhow, so he would frequently just disappear, not come in, not bother, not tell them, and just go on long drug binges. He also was inappropriate towards the owner's daughter, who also worked in the shop, also the wife. He also turns out that he was stealing from the shop, and that would end up being the reason that he did eventually lose this job. The daughter that worked in the shop was called Nisha. Now, she was of a similar age to Brian, a few years younger. He was 24 and she was 21. Nisha would tell her parents about Brian's behaviour. And while I don't think it was taken particularly seriously, I'm being really careful about it because I think they probably feel bad enough. But they didn't really, it doesn't feel like his behaviour was taken very seriously and again, it was in the it was back in the day. So, like I said, the whole thing at school with the groping of girls and things like that. Like now, that child would be boom off. Like it would be taken really freaking seriously. But back then, like even when I was at school, things like that were swept under under the carpet. Or not even that. Like not even that. Not even swept under the carpet. Just almost like oh, boys will be boys. Like that sort of thing. Yeah crazy actually when you think about it like looking back on it but anyway so there was a different it was a different time even so even though his behavior towards Nisha was not really taken as seriously as it should have been or it would have been now they never allowed Nisha and Brian to be left alone in the shop together so that happened quite early doors so they were worried enough to just be like okay he can't be on his own with her he was inappropriately touching her. He just was, he was, mm, it was just inappropriate the way that he was with her, being very much in her personal space, uh, very familiar when they were, you know, just work colleagues. But he, it, it was sort of like in his mind, it was more than that. So that's creepy, really creepy. He was all up in her business. So she was uncomfortable. They weren't left alone together. And then it would become apparent that in his mind, Nisha was making advances towards him. That was not happening. That wasn't happening at all. And that's what is so scary about people like that because they really believe, they really believe that these things are going on. I find it terrifying. So he believed that he was in a relationship with Nisha. Things would just go so wrong. I mean, it's already like, you know, wrong in many ways, but Nisha found out that Brian was stealing from her father's shop. So she told her dad. And at this point, that was the final straw. And Nisha's dad had a confrontation with Brian. Brian was incredibly angry. He was already angry that he was not allowed to be alone with Nisha, I bet. I wonder why. Uh -huh. 
So he was already annoyed about that because it, he felt like they were coming in between a couple when they were really not a couple at all. And then he was confronted about stealing and Brian knew that Nisha was the person that had told her dad. So he was then very, very angry with Nisha because he saw this as a betrayal. He felt that him and Nisha, in his mind, they were a couple. So when she told her dad about the stealing, he felt like she had betrayed him. Brian would lose his job because of this. And later on, he returned to the shop when he knew that Nisha would be there on her own. And he assaulted Nisha. He grabbed her. He shouted at her. He couldn't believe that she had wronged him or betrayed him. And yeah, he really frightened her. So Brian has been fired. And then on the 18th of March in 1993, Brian walks back into the shop. This time he is armed with a hammer. Nisha is working in the shop that day with her younger brother. Brian walks over to her younger brother and he hits him incredibly hard around the head, which renders her brother, you know, incapacitated for a bit. He then goes on to attack Nisha and he hits her so hard and so often on her head that it exposes her brain. Her younger brother comes to at some point and witnesses some of this just brutal attack on her on his sister and he he runs he has to run because when Brian notices that he's you know with it again he he chases him because he wants to he wants to finish what he started he wants to kill her brother as well luckily her younger brother does manage to get away and then because Brian's chased after him he then flees sadly Nisha dies on her way to the hospital It was just such a horrific and brutal and sustained attack. Like she just took so many blows to her head. And then interestingly, Brian is found nearby-ish in Battersea at the bottom of a block of flats with both of his legs really badly broken because he had then realised the severity of what he had just done. Off he goes, he's running, he's trying to escape. He finds this, comes across this block of flats And he goes up to the third floor, I believe. You know, like you have walkways in between flats. I'll share a picture. It won't be the same block, I don't think. But I'll share a picture of what I mean. And he he fumbles his attempt to unalive himself. He he gets it like a bit wrong, I think, because he hesitates and he's like, oh, actually, no. After his injuries are healed or like nearly healed, he is then sent to a secure hospital for the murder of Nisha. He is deemed to be mentally ill. He remains there until 2001. During his time there he is basically a model patient and I think kind of what happens is that they almost have him pinned as like the poster child of rehabilitation. So he yeah he's really pliable, he is calm, it seems like he's just improving after the initial, you know, when he first gets there. Over the years, it seems like he is rehabilitated, healed. He's moved to Hackney to a medium secure place for six months. And then he is moved. And I think that's quite quick. But anyway, he's then moved to and also. Sorry, the vein is already <laughs> there's so many like we're really <sighs> because the whole thing is eight years so he's in that like high security facility hospital then he's in a medium secure place for six months and then he's put into a 24 hour like supervised hostel so but they can come and go the people that live there can come and go but the hostel is supervised like all the time but you know eight years he murdered someone so even if you were not mentally ill which is what they deemed him to be at the time of Nisha's murder if you if you if you killed somebody even if it was like oh, I don't know manslaughter I think people get longer sentences eight years and then basically he was back into the into society I think that's wrong even if you are deemed mentally ill and you're making progress I, I just think eight years is that's a joke he killed somebody that's a joke. I just, I, yeah. When people kill people, like normally you hear, oh, you know, life sentence, minimum 20 years, minimum 30 years, eight years. 
it just makes me cross if that does. Guarantee it's bunny. Get them out. Cynical safe. All of the professionals, of which there were quite a few because he's been in facility, facility, facility. He has to obviously see people every week. He's monitored 24 hours a day. They all agree that he does not pose a threat to the public. So we must remember that. They all agree on that. A psychiatrist, all the people that are involved in his care, they're like, oh yeah, he does not pose a threat. He lives in the hostel, 24-hour supervised hostel for two years. And then he assaults a 17-year-old girl. He takes himself a week later to a psychiatric hospital ward and admits himself. I think he does that more out of fear for his own life than anything else because the family of that girl are like whoa I think they're the sort of family that want to take stuff into their own hands they want him to leave the area they want him to move they want him to leave otherwise they will hurt him and he doesn't have the means to be or go anywhere else because he's effectively you know he's supported by the council he's living in this hostel and so I think that's why he checks himself into the psychiatric ward <laughs> he's there for a week and again he can come and go because he's there on a voluntary basis and this annoys me as well so they the staff they know about the assault on the 17 year old girl i don't know whether he was very truthful about it but they do know and uh look at his history right do you think they did that probably not so they are like well done oh well freaking done they think do you know what he's amazing he is rehabilitated and then he's made a mistake and he's sought help how about look a little bit deeper right Bane? because he's seeking help maybe they don't know this to be fair but probably like you know out of fear and also he has just he's he's done something like he's not done a thing for all of these years mainly because he's been in a secure place now he's in 24 hour assisted you know living or whatever and it it does that not maybe make you think that he may be not be ready for this much freedom perhaps because he, he what no they're just like well done for coming to, to us and getting help well done but off you go you can come and go as you please thank you sir <laughs> i just feel like i would see that myself as a decline a decline in you know somebody that was otherwise doing quite well and then they've done that so I would be watching that person very very carefully and not just be letting them wander in and out, in and out unsupervised but that's just me on the 17th of February 2004 Brian leaves the hospital I think it's about 3 p.m he tells everyone the staff that he's going to visit a friend this friend is called this is confusing Brian first name cherry so brian cherry and brian cherry is a vulnerable person he's a vulnerable man i think he's 43 and i didn't write that down silly me but i think he's in his 40s and he lives alone he doesn't have a partner and in a, in a flat and he has questionable friends because he is so so lonely he will give money to people if they will talk to him and be his friend he opens his door to people so that they can use his flat to take drugs he gives them money for those drugs he is just happy if he has got somebody to talk to and be his friend that's really sad i think that is very very sad and he must have been just so lonely he just allows himself to be taken advantage of so that he can you know not be on his own on his way to brian cherry's flat brian stops in a shop and he buys a hammer, screwdriver and a Stanley knife. He arrives at Brian Cherry's flat and it is not very long at all before he attacks him. He hits him 24 times with the hammer. Rehabilitation! Rehabilitation! He then dismembers the body with the tools that I mentioned, hammer, screwdriver and a Stanley knife. I I don't even that it must have just been really like what a gruesome just such a mess he used brute force he stamped and 
on the bones and things like that. And basically, he he tr- he ripped his body apart. Where he has hit, similar to to with Nisha, he's he's hit Brian Cherry so much in the head that it's exposed some of his brain. So he removes some of Brian Cherry's brain, and he goes to the kitchen. He puts a saucepan on the hob. He adds some butter to that saucepan, and then he fries some of Brian Cherry's brain. He then goes on to eat it. I'm not thinking rehabilitation. I'm thinking this is a serial killer that has been dormant for a long time because he hasn't had an opportunity to kill. And and here we go. This is not rehabilitation. This is escalation. Also, I do believe from my many, many hours of watching Criminal Minds and things like that, that a serial killer can spend a long time just with the fantasy of their first murder so they can have a like a dormant period for quite a long time and not only that but they can have a dormant period where they are like living off of the memory of what they've done and then they have another period where they can be satisfied with the thought of what they are going to do so yeah he hasn't had very long to have the opportunity to be out and unsupervised and plan something so I think that's what's happened here he spent all of his time in secure facility with that memory of what he did do and then when he began to have more freedom he probably started to fantasize about what he was going to do to somebody else and then he took his chance about an hour after Brian had arrived at Brian Cherry's flat a woman turns up at the flat she happens to be she knows both both of the Bryans Peter Bryan and Brian Cherry she knows them she actually was the woman that introduced Brian to Brian Cherry right we all okay so and she she comes and the door isn't properly shut on the flat so she pushes it open and she is greeted by Brian with no top on, he's like naked from like up up here, covered in blood, as you can imagine, Mm. calm as as you like, chill, calm, whatever, he looks at her and he just says, you need to leave, but she doesn't realise in that moment, like the severity of what the hell is going on, she, you know, she's, she, she might be high, I'm not sure, she's coming down because she wanted to get money from Brian Cherry, that's why she was there. She wanted money for drugs. So she was in a bit of a state anyway. And then she sees past Brian and she sees the dismembered or partially dismembered body of Brian Cherry. Just in the in the in the room, just there. And it's in that moment that she's like, oh my days. Like, what are you gonna do there? So she stays really calm because at this point Brian's really calm. And she just says, okay, yeah, no, no worries. I'll, um, I'll be off. And she leaves calmly. Like she just stays nice and calm as if like nothing's happened. And then as soon as she's out of sight, she runs for her life. Cause she's just like, whoa, imagine seeing that as well. Just, what? and she goes to find the police. So they are actually on the scene quite early on. They're, they're there. It's not like the crime scene is found days later. They get there and he is still there. Brian is still there. And it smells like bleach and everything because his intention was not to be caught. That's why he was dismembering the body because he wanted to like go. He was going to eat, have his snack of brain and then dismember the body and and hide the body because he wasn't finished. He didn't want to be caught. He had it in his head that there were going to be more victims. So he hadn't planned on this woman turning up. He didn't chase her. He didn't He didn't even try. He just carried on with what he was doing until the police arrived. When they arrive, it is a gruesome, gruesome sight, as you can imagine, and a lot of blood, although I do think he's had a bit of a cleaning up, and, and a plate with knife and fork all set out brain matter and all that business going on and he's he is just so calm 
they they noted like how calm he was. He wasn't like in a frenzy or anything like that. No, he was just chill. And he says to them, I ate his brain with butter. It was nice. Brian is arrested. Brian is charged with murder. While he is in prison waiting for his trial, he does some crazy things. I think that Brian is cleverer than people gave him, give him credit for, because I think he, or maybe I'm wrong and he is just a nutcase, but he did some things like he punched a police officer, he tried to set fire to his cell, he, well he did, and he then, he assaulted another, like a prison guard, he, he was a bit out of control and therefore he ended up in Broadmoor. So yet again, they establish that he is mentally ill, right? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. So he's now in high secure mental hospital for the criminally insane Broadmoor. That's the big guns. That is the big guns. Interestingly, at the time of Brian Cherry's murder, before he was put into prison, he was found to, like, they deemed him not mentally ill because I think he was so calm. So they, they deemed him okay to stand trial that's why I say I think he was clever because I think he then did these things to get himself to, to make himself seem like a crazy person I mean he look at what he's done whatever the case the poster child of rehabilitation was now deemed to be one of the most dangerous prisoners to ever be admitted into Broadmoor and I don't think everybody got the memo because on the 25th of April in 2004, Brian would attack another inmate, Richard Loudwell, 59, in an unsupervised dining room. Can't get my head around that. Let's just, the vein might burst. I'm going to try and be chill. Right? Unsupervised dining room. He strangled him with the cord out of his jogging bottoms, but he wasn't you know, he wasn't working quickly enough. So he then smashed his head into the floor, into the table, into the walls. It was a sustained, brutal attack. It was also planned. That's the other thing. It was a planned attack. It wasn't like, oh, he looked at me funny. He planned it. He had told other inmates that something was going to happen. And while he was brutally attacking and smashing this man's head around the place, the other inmates that were in on it were singing a song to drown out the noise. What the actual? Richard survived for six weeks and then he died in hospital. And then again, Brian was charged with murder. So we three murders now. So now he is a serial killer. When he was interviewed, he said he would have eaten... Loudwell if he had more time and if he had the right equipment but he didn't. He then pleads not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility. At this point he is diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and a personality disorder and that seems to have taken a long time doesn't it? A long long time. He is then returned to Broadmoor where he is, will be for the rest of his life, finally. So he will be behind bars for the rest of his life. And hopefully, I mean, I find it a little bit bizarre that any part of Broadmoor is unsupervised. That any, Well, or not, not any part, but any person there is unsupervised. Like I said, it's the big guns. So I find it really, really... When I read that, I was just like, really? There's enough people there that were unsupervised, that they could stand around and sing a song to cover up the noise. That just, yeah, that's just not what I would have expected at all. I thought they were very heavily supervised at all times. What do I know? Oh, God, my hair's doing my head in today, guys. It's all static and annoying and it needs colouring, it needs cutting, it's too long and it's too everything. And we're There was an NHS inquiry into... Brian and his case, his, his, all of it, quite rightly so. And they did find failings. To be fair, <clears throat> the more I heard about it, the more I was like, okay. So what, what they were saying was <clears throat> Brian didn't always exhibit typical signs of paranoid schizophrenia, which had he done so, and to be fair again, I think he did, but what, right. So they were saying he wasn't a cut and dry textbook case, so it's harder to pick up on. They argued that there was no visible decline before he 
carried out attacks. Therefore, he was never diagnosed. They said normally somebody with paranoid schizophrenia, when they're on a decline, they have like really bad personal hygiene, for example, or visual and audio hallucinations. That's quite common. But Brian was like a calm before the storm. It wasn't a decline. And so it got missed. However, there was evidence that things were wrong before he killed Nisha. So Nisha's mum came forward and said that before he killed Nisha, he came into the shop about five days before and he bought her a little silver trinket box. And he he was very odd and he wasn't well, like she said, he he was he was smelly and he he wasn't washing at that time. So he the hygiene thing. And he his behaviour was bizarre. He ate the label off the bottom of the little silver trinket box that he bought, like he ate it in front of them. Like it was just really odd. So there were, you know, displays of bizarre behaviour and there was a decline in his personal hygiene at that time. Also Nisha's mum noticed that when he did, he came back later that day, I think, and when Nisha was at the shop and he was giving her the trinket box thing, the present, and he was really nice. So Nisha's mum said it was a very big difference. Like he was very, very nice. He wasn't unkind or aggressive or intimidating. He was being nice. So that is odd behaviour, isn't it? I would say, like, you know, it's unusual behaviour. The inquiry, though, went on to say that no matter what, they wouldn't have been able to prevent Brian Cherry and Richard Loudwell's murders. Sorry, what? What? Especially Richard Loudwell. Uh, So this guy is put into, for, for a third murder, Third murder, no, second. He's gone in for a second murder, Sophie. So he's killed Nisha and he's killed Brian Cherry and he's now deemed one of the most dangerous people to go into Broadmoor, right? Out of all of the people. that That's crazy. He's deemed that dangerous and he is unsupervised in a dining room. I don't know about that. I think you definitely could have avoided that murder, don't you? How could that, how can you say that? Oh, we couldn't have done anything to prevent that. What? Uh, what? Also, Nisha was murdered and he was out and about. Oh, fuck. Everything's falling down. London Bridge is falling down. A little makeshift set, everything fell apart. Yeah. Where was I? So when he had murdered Nisha, within within eight years, he was he was out and about, out and about, unsupervised. I think there was a big failing from that moment. Like he should not have just been like, oh, mentally ill. Oh wow, look at him go. Rehabilitation. Doesn't matter. Still got to serve the time, I think. That is my opinion, but I think so. So I think they very well could have avoided Brian Cherry's murder as well, because if he was in prison for another, or incarcerated for another 12 years, things might have been different. Maybe he would have then tried, it would have been such a longer period for him to keep up his dormant behaviour, because I think it was that. I think he was just dormant. But I think that if he'd have be, had to have stayed in that hospital for longer, I think the urges to kill again would have become... He, he might have murdered... Oh, that was not my mum. He might have murdered somebody different in, his, in, you know, wherever he was or attempted something. But I think, yeah, but I think that would have happened. Who knows? Can you rehabilitate somebody that is mentally ill? That's a question. Can you? successfully. Also, in 1987, I think if they'd have pieced everything together and had it all, like, thought about everything as a whole. So in 1987, he had effectively tried to kill somebody by throwing them off of a building. Well, you know, that's unusual behaviour. But that doesn't seem to have ever been taken into account and he wasn't... Nothing came from that. He 
admitted that he had wanted, always wanted to kill eight people. So it was all going on, all going on here. And I think perhaps this calm, rehabilitated person was throwing them off. But man, I also read that the people that were working with Brian were inexperienced. So it was his social worker. It was her first case of ever working with somebody that had killed somebody. And mm, so it's just, I think they really, they, I think they underestimated him. That's what I think. That is what I think. They underestimated him as a threat. Some argue as well, because Richard Loudwell, so his third victim, was obviously in Broadmoor, and he had committed heinous act, grim, grimness. So some people are a little bit like, oh well, oh well, you know, like a vigilante sort of type thing, situation. But it doesn't, yeah, I still just, no matter what you think about who he's murdered, you know, whether whether they deserve to be murdered or not, it it still blows my mind that he was able to. Yeah, and that's really worrying. What if that, because also, also, what if that had been like an orderly, somebody that works at the hospital walking through or past, be a very different story then, wouldn't it? Everyone would be up in arms and it would be, you know, really, really tragic. It's It's not, no one, yeah. So just don't have them unsupervised. Maybe. Again, probably understaffed, probably not enough money. It's all down to funding. Always, always, always. And that is all I have for you on today's horrific case. Also, just one more thing, one more thing to add, because I forgot, I can't believe I forgot. But he was called in the papers, Peckish Pete. And I think that that's amazing, because all of these, you know, like these serial killers, when they get given like kind of scary names, and I think a lot of the time they kind of want the notoriety. Um, is that English? They want the fame. Another word. They they want you know that's you know part of it for them being yeah like admired and all of that jazz, all of that sick. So yeah, to me, I think they should all be given crazy like stupid names like silly names yeah I just think it's fun it's funner and it sort of diminishes I know it I don't mean it diminishes their crime but it's like oh you're not going to be some scary monster name you're going to be peckish p so how are we all I hope everyone is okay hope you're all having a lovely week it is the first week of the summer holidays here so I am frazzled it always takes everyone just like a week or two to settle in but in the first week of the big holidays it is like everyone just turns crazy i'm i'm doing all right actually i've been quite patient quite patient i did sit in a soft play area today nearly literally my child in a soft play jamboree like you know all the business going on i'll share a picture of one like it all of that business comes over like I thought oh no I've been hurt something's happened what's you okay you know does someone push you what's what's occurring because they're like wild in there aren't they like literally wild animals <sighs> no what's wrong I'm bored I'm bored oh my god so there's just a little insight and I did inter internally I was like biting my face. It all ended fine in the end. Um, food was given, water, and then all was okay. But I just could not believe it. I'd rather be at home watching a film, mate. Instead, I'm here like going deaf, drinking a cold coffee that tastes like shite. While you're like, look at me, look at me. But hey ho, week one. Maybe it was a bit ambitious for week one to expect, you know fun i'm going to love you and leave you just so you know for the next six weeks you are going to be my utter sanctuary until next time thank you for joining me for another episode of sin and tonic hope you can join me next week for another true crime story and a large glass of gin i keep not having gin but i'm trying to 
film on a different schedule. Can't always be drinking gin at 9am. What are you going to do? Have a beautiful week. Love you, miss you. Really want to kiss you. Oh, do you remember doing that? With sunglasses. Ooh. Okay. Love you. Love you. Bye.